Good afternoon. I'm Brent Russo, Manitoba's Chief Provincial Public Health Officer. Uh, the current five-day test positivity rate is 1.19%. There are 25 new cases of COVID-19 that have been identified as of uh, 9.30 a.m. today. Uh, this brings the total number of lab-confirmed positive and probable positive cases in Manitoba to 603. Uh, our data shows uh, there are seven current hospitalizations, uh, including three of which are in intensive care, 218 active cases, and 377 individuals uh, are listed as recovered. Uh, the number of deaths due to COVID-19 uh, remains at eight. Our preliminary testing numbers show uh, 1,817 lab tests were performed uh, on Sunday. And this brings our total testing numbers to 108,211. We're recommending that uh, Manitobans only go for testing uh, if you have symptoms of COVID-19 or have been directed by a healthcare provider uh, to be tested. Uh, testing without symptoms uh, puts uh, undue stress on the, on the testing system right now. Um, and we know that the, the value of a negative test in a person without symptoms is, is low. Uh, so we really wanna focus our efforts on symptomatic individuals or those individuals who have been directed by healthcare providers to be tested. Uh, Prairie Mountain Health has updated their testing site hours operation. Visit manitoba.ca slash COVID-19 for those revised hours. Uh, preliminary information for today uh, shows that a majority of cases in Prairie Mountain Health uh, are contacts um, of, no of known cases. Uh, the WRHA uh, cases appear to be either travel related or close contacts to a, a known case. Uh, investigations are uh, still ongoing. Uh, as of August 12, there are 67 cases linked uh, to the Brandon cluster. Uh, 26 are linked to a, a business in Brandon, um, and 23 of those 26 are, are directly linked to that Brandon cluster. Uh, all these cases are self-isolating, and uh, contact tracing uh, is, uh, is underway to uh, uh, determine close contacts. Um, We've said for the last uh, uh, few days that um, these uh, COVID numbers are reminding us that COVID is not done with, with us. We need to continue to practice those fundamentals that we uh, always discuss. We know Manitobans are, are concerned with the increased numbers. Um, and uh, again, I reiterate that we have never been helpless against this virus. We have uh, acted and responded in the past and we can do uh, the same now. These are concrete steps. These are focusing on the fundamentals. And uh, we've become well accustomed to what those are. Uh, staying home when you're ill, even if it's mildly unwell. Uh, practicing good hand hygiene, not sharing items with others. Uh, practicing physical distancing uh, when you're outside uh, of your household. And that means staying two meters, six feet from others outside your home. Um, if you're unable to physically distance outside your home, uh, then you should be wearing a mask. Uh, but if physically distancing cannot be maintained, then other precautions uh, should be taken, including leaving that, uh, that event. Um, and then again, reiterating, um, Manitobans who are symptomatic should be uh, staying at home. If you're ill, even just mildly ill, uh, please stay home. Uh, there are a number of businesses now that are requiring masks. Um, and we know that masks can be a useful tool in preventing the spread of COVID-19. It's certainly not the only tool, it's certainly not the most important tool. We know those fundamentals that we need to stick to are uh, uh, much more important regardless of mask use. Uh, but if you are in a, a situation where physically distancing uh, can't be obtained, uh, then we're recommending you wear a mask. Uh, in addition to that is if, if you're not sure, if you're not certain uh, that you're gonna be able to maintain that physical distancing, uh, you should be uh, donning a mask. So in many indoor uh, uh, locations, uh, if you're not assured that you can maintain physical distancing, uh, uh, please wear a mask. Those that are at higher risk of the severe outcomes of COVID-19, those over age 65 or with underlying medical condi conditions, need to take extra caution. Need to ensure you're not uh, in crowded places, uh, frequent hand washing, uh, certainly practicing physical distancing at all time. 
we've provided that advice of uh, symptomatic individuals seeking testing. Uh, it is best to uh, seek testing um, uh, roughly 24 hours after the symptom onset. Uh, we know that uh, uh, many cases, uh, uh, often because symptoms are very mild, people are waiting many, many days to get tested. Um, it's best to get that testing as, as uh, early on uh, as the symptoms develop and, and preferably um, uh, after 24 hours of that symptom onset is when the test is most uh, sensitive. And that's uh, key to our response, uh, ensuring we're identifying case early, having them self-isolate, uh, and then um, isolating the close contacts. Uh, and we see that these cases that we announced that are uh, previous contacts, uh, either related to a cluster or just to known cases, uh, these are people who have been self-isolating. They develop symptoms while they're self-isolating, so they will not have a list of, of contacts. Um, and so uh, this is the way to, one of the best ways to control the spread uh, of COVID. As mentioned on Monday, uh, the COVID-19 dashboard uh, can help provide uh, additional information and has been updated to include health districts. There are 68 districts in Manitoba in total, um, uh, 13 in Prairie Mountain Health, 24 in uh, Southern Health, 14 in Interlake Eastern, 15 in uh, the uh, Northern Health Region, and two in the WHA. Sorry. Can you Oh, repeat that. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, this is the 68 total districts in in Manitoba, and uh, broken down into 13 in Prairie Mountain Health, 24 in Southern Health, 14 in Interlake Eastern, 15 in Northern Health Authority, and uh, two in uh, Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. Uh, so these are uh, made up of multiple communities and uh, municipalities. Um, but it's helping us uh, provide Manitobans with a more narrowed geographic view of, um, uh, of where uh, cases are being identified. Uh, so Winnipeg and Brandon will continue to be reported by uh, the whole uh, community. Uh, breaking down uh, those numbers uh, more specifically isn't uh, really going to help the public health uh, efforts. Uh, so again, um, all Manitobans need to practice those fundamentals. So we're providing this information for uh, the increased uh, clarity to Manitobans to, uh, to see where cases are being identified. Um, but we, uh, we don't want Manitobans to um, uh, ease up on the fundamentals in areas that may not right now be uh, showing cases. Uh, again, we remind Manitobans uh, to be kind to each other. Uh, that stigma is not part of our p pandemic plan. Stigma adversely affects Manitoba's uh, um, public health ability uh, to counteract this pandemic. Uh, stigma will decrease the likelihood that people will be forthcoming with public health. Uh, and we uh, certainly see examples of that where stigma starts uh, to uh, affect people's um, willingness to provide a lot of information to public health because of things like shame and stigma. Uh, there is certainly no blame uh, to people who have acquired uh, COVID-19. Um, and there should be no stigma on those that have acquired it or have recovered from it. Uh, we are all in this together, and the best way to uh, battle this virus is that people can be forthcoming um, and we can do our full contact investigation. So please don't stigmatize individuals or businesses or even locations. Um, that uh, stigma is, is definitely our uh, enemy. Um, you can visit our website, manitoba.ca slash COVID-19 for up-to-date information. And, uh, and now I'm going to pass it over to Minister Gertson. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Rusin. Good afternoon to everyone who's in the room, uh, those who are on the phone and others who are watching online. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with Dr. Rusin, and I would say to him, as I've said before, I want to thank him and his officials at Public Health for the work that they've been doing together with the uh, Department of Education. It is not a new relationship. Public health has uh, always been involved with schools uh, and with school divisions over uh, the years for a variety of different issues, but obviously this is uh, a little different and perhaps a bit more of an intense in terms of the, uh, the relationship, but it's continuing on, of course, the work that they've done in the past with schools. Uh, there's going to be uh, a lot of information uh, given and more information given by Dr. Russo when it comes to some of the health protocols, 
uh, that we'll be using as we return to school on September 8th. Uh, but not all of it will be able to be transmitted here in this press conference. But uh, for those who are interested on manitoba.ca slash restoring safe services, so manitoba.ca slash restoring safe services, you will find uh, a lengthy document on provincial protocols uh, as well as a parent's guide that is a little bit easier for, for parents to access. Uh, and I know that, that parents, when I look at this now through a parent's eyes, and I am a parent who has a son who will be uh, going to high school uh, starting on September 8th, there are always lots of questions, as there should be. And I know that there's been lots of questions over the last uh, weeks and months when it comes to returning to school. Um, in trying to answer those questions, we've had great partnerships uh, together with the many stakeholders in education, Manitoba Teachers Society, Manitoba Association of School Boards, uh, the Manitoba Federation of Independent Schools, and the Manitoba Association of School Superintendents have all been at the table daily uh, as we work towards uh, protocols that are being released uh, today. And I want to thank them for, for their input. Not that there's always going to agree, be agreement on everything. Uh, that might be too high of an expectation, but certainly they've been uh, fundamental and uh, very important in getting us uh, to this point today. It is important to think a little bit about where we've come from, of course. Um, at the end of March, the announcement was made that in-school classes would be suspended. That was ultimately extended for the balance of the school year. Uh, together with uh, Dr. Rusin and Public Health, the decision was made, uh, but also to give one week's notice at that point. And I know that there was concern uh, then about the one week's notice or as many um, uh, absentees during that week, but uh, following the advice of Public Health, uh, it was the right decision and, um, and giving that week's notice made sense both from a system perspective and also from a, uh, a health perspective. Then as we moved uh, closer to June, the decision was made uh, with public health advice to go to a limited use of schools uh, where we welcome back thousands of students into classes in a more limited way in June, one of three provinces to do that together with British Columbia and Quebec, I believe. Uh, and while there was concern expressed at that time as well, um, that experience was successful and I think it meant a lot to students and to teachers and to others to be able to welcome those thousands of uh, students back into the classes in June. During this time there's been uh, summer school in many different uh, schools and so there are still and have been um, students accessing uh, the school system. All that to say there's been lots of preparation that's been happening uh, since March uh, on a lot of different things in terms of establishing and setting up schools and protocols within individual schools. We did though in, in June talk about uh, three scenarios and ask the school divisions to prepare for those three scenarios. They were busy uh, during those summer months working on that. We were able to uh, more closely identify the scenario that we would be in uh, several weeks later. Uh, and together with these protocols, which they've been helping uh, design together with public health, they've been refining their individual division and school plans. And so the questions that uh, I've been getting, of course, from parents are, what are the overall provincial protocols and requirements? And those are being released today and, as I mentioned, are online to be viewed now. And then there'll be specific questions about what about my son or my daughter's school? Uh, what does the class schedule look like? Where do they enter? Those sort of specific school and division level planning uh, documents will be available uh, next week. And so you can see there is um, a very systematic process to this. We've learned. Uh, from things that happened in March. We've learned from the limited reuse of schools in June. We've been learning from summer school. Um, we are now informed by the protocols which are finalized today, uh, which will then flow down to those individual school and division plans that will be released next week, about three weeks in advance of school reopening on September 8th to give um, parents and uh, uh, teachers and, of course, students time to prepare for that. 
So again, uh, it is with great thanks, say, say, to public health and to others uh, within the Department of Education uh, and throughout the broader uh, education system. It's been a summer like no other, and they've been working really hard uh, daily behind the scenes. I know that uh, there's always a desire to have new information put out every day, um, but the work happens behind the scenes every day to get to uh, points like this where uh, information can be uh, provided and of course then there'll be more of that specific information next week. So I know that Dr. Rusin wants to walk through some of the health protocols as it relates to uh, school and today's announcement. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mr. Uh, so specifically to, uh, to schools, we'll t speak a bit of the um uh, the protocols being uh, put forth. So physical distancing of two meters, six, six feet uh, between individuals should occur whenever reasonably possible. Um, when that physical distancing is not possible, then the use of cohorts uh, can be used to limit the exposure and, and also facilitate contact tracing if, if required. Um, public health encourages the use of outdoor space as much as possible. Uh, the Certainly the fundamentals are in place there. Regular hand washing, uh, including assistance to younger children uh, to ensure hand washing is done frequently. Um, good cough etiquette, coughing into the uh, uh, elbow, um, disposing of tissues properly, um, increasing the frequency of cleaning, disinfection and sanitization will be uh, a major component, especially on high touch surfaces um, and in common shared areas. Uh, we provided advice regarding ventilation um, and uh, wanted to also mention that uh, for uh, grades uh, 5 uh, to 12, uh, mask use is going to be strongly recommended uh, in, in, uh, when physical distancing cannot be obtained. It's going to be required for that uh, group on buses. Uh, and so uh, those uh, uh, children will be encouraged to uh, have their own non-medical mask, uh, but uh, mask will be provided uh, should they uh, not have their own. Um, we know that we need to anticipate uh, COVID-19 cases to occur in, in schools, and so we've been planning in that regard. Uh, so public health will do, work very closely with school administrators in identifying uh, close contacts and notifying them and advising them to self-isolate. Um, the areas of school where exposures took place will be cleaned and disinfected and those areas will not be used again until it's determined safe uh, to do so. School communities will be notified uh, when a child in their school has a confirmed case once those close contacts have been identified. Uh, and a closure of a school would be uh, the last resort. Um, all of these precautions that we are taking here is to minimize the number of uh, uh, one cases, but also minimize the number of students who would actually be a, a close contact. Um, so certainly um, those who are close contact will be required to self-isolate for 14 days. Um, but the idea is to not uh, require the closure of an entire school should we start to uh, see cases. Um, and yeah, and I think that's the um, uh, the public health uh, news with as far as the the protocol. So I can uh, open up to uh, to questions. Thank you, Doctor. We're going to go to the phone first. Uh, up first will be Scott from the Winnipeg Sun. Doctor Rusin, uh, Scott from Winnipeg Sun. Um, why not just? I mean, we're strongly recommending. We're doing all, why not just mandate the mask? Like, well, what is the apprehension here? Of, of mandating the mask when you're already strongly recommending yeah, well, this has been the the approach in, in Manitoba. Uh, we've uh, made public health recommendations. Manitobans have largely stepped up and followed them. So at this point, we're uh, we're strongly recommending it. And um, like in the past, we expect Manitobans to follow our recommendations. Um, things like mandating uh, things are, are used for uh, you know cases when it's when it's required. So it's certainly not off the table. But we're going to go with a strong recommendation and and follow it closely. And there's there's four uh, so four or five um, children under nine today that have uh, contracted the virus according to the release. Um, I guess I guess the question is, I mean, why not just take the why not just take that, that extra precaution to mandate for school children at least, given the close proximity, given they're already going to do it on buses. Like, why not just why not just do it? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think that we're going to strongly recommend it. Uh, and if, uh, if that doesn't work, then, then we could mandate it. But uh, we, we, we're not back yet, and so uh, we're going to rely on Manitobans to follow recommendations, which uh, they largely have. Up next, from CBC Radio Canada, Ezra. Uh, hi, actually, my, my question is, uh, is a bit the same, but I would like to hear Mr. Gertson regarding uh, that uh, mandatory, uh, ma uh, putting the mark in the, in the mandatory uh, way, because, I mean, there's a big debate right now, and even though you are strongly recommending the mask, I mean, it's still a bit free for, for all. I mean, they, people can do what they want. So I'm just wondering why the government wouldn't like decide to take you know, like a, a, a definitive position so the behavior would be of uh, all the parents would be coherent to protect the children. So I think that one of the uh, successes that we can point to in Manitoba is that we've really been guided by uh, public health advice. So whether that is uh, advice that we're receiving here in Manitoba, it's also consistent with the advice, I believe, that comes from Health Canada on the strong uh, recommendation. And I do think that Manitobans, uh, and one of the reasons why we have been successful uh, compared to most jurisdictions in Canada uh, and in North America are more successful than those jurisdictions is because we're following uh, that advice. And the approach in terms of recommendation, uh, I think uh, Manitobans have responded uh, and have taken the precautions that are right for them and for their families uh, and continuing on with uh, what made us successful so far, uh, I think is the most uh, likely way to make us successful in the future. Okay, to, uh, to make this uh, all year your plan work, the, uh, the, the parents will need the same flexibility from their employers that is asked from the education system. I'm just uh, wondering, are you a kind of a championing, you know, like defending the parents with your different colleagues, uh, Mr. Pallister, you know, like we're starting up the economy, but I mean, are you making sure that like the, the other um, uh, government authorities are, are, are have this idea in, in their head that uh, parents will need flexibility too? I, I think that everyone in uh, government uh, and everybody within our caucus, and I would assume everybody within the legislature, understands that we need to be sensitive and and understanding of the fact that we're in difficult and uh, different times. And uh, as I've said before, uh, we're all in the same storm, but not everybody's in the same boat. And so there are families for whom this is going to be more difficult and more of a challenge. And Dr. Rusin, uh, he talks about the fundamentals, of course, every day. Uh, but one of the additional fundamentals that I think he refers to is kindness. And kindness also extends to understanding those different circumstances that people are in. And so I think that businesses, uh, by and large in Manitoba, have always uh, looked at their employees uh, as a valuable asset, their most valuable asset, uh, want to maintain that valuable asset, and they will work with them to ensure that where there are difficulties as it relates to parents and the school system, uh, our hope, of course, was that they would be uh, flexible and understanding to that. And I do believe the Manitobans overall feel that um, we are truly in this together. It's not just a slogan. Uh, we sometimes see that demonstrated in very overt and obvious ways, but more often it's demonstrated uh, in smaller ways, in neighbor to neighbor, in community to community. Uh, and so I think that that will extend uh, into the business community and otherwise. Thank you, Minister. We now return to the News Conference Theatre. Minister Gerson, um, in addition to the 48 million that was identified last time you were here, uh, how much more money is the province prepared to offer schools, all of them, to help this pandemic plan work? So, yeah, thanks very much for the question, uh, Bart. So uh, obviously, as we said in the last uh, press conference, we would be working with school divisions to identify uh, what their needs are. They won't all be the same. Uh, in every school division, but there was sort of a common um, request from the different school divisions when it comes to masks and providing of, uh, of masks. And so 
Um, they wanted to ensure that there was equity there and that there was availability within, uh, within the schools and the school system. So we are going to be providing those non-medical masks, reusable masks, or masks that can be used just one time uh, if that is uh, required. So that is going to cost uh, into the millions. Uh, we know that. Uh, there'll be additional asks, I'm sure, that are going to come from the school divisions as we go through that, and we'll continue to, um, to look at those needs. So we made the commitment that where there was sort of a demonstrated need, we would look to try to uh, fill that need. This one came up. I think it's a different approach, though, than, than just throwing out uh, a global number and saying there's going to be this pot of money and uh, let's uh, let's see how everybody wants to use it. It really is about what are your needs, let's come to that agreement and then uh, we'll look to see how we can meet those needs. So this was the first one that was identified most, uh, most clearly. There'll be others, I'm sure, but I think we've demonstrated we're willing to work with school divisions that and that will include providing additional funds. We were Thank told you. in the briefing that no specific money has been set aside yet for these school divisions, that they were A, first asked to use those savings from last year, then to start looking where they can cut expenses, and then come to the province. So do you guys have no money specifically set aside? So I think uh, there isn't a, a a delineated dollar amount. So we're not saying there is a hundred million dollars that is sort of in a place that can be used. But as there are requests and needs, those things have to be paid for. And so when it comes to masks, I wouldn't be able to tell you uh, exactly what the costs are because we're not being we're not procuring them directly out of education. Uh, they'll be procured through central services, I would expect, but it will be in the millions. And so uh, while there isn't a, so the answer was correct that you received this morning, while there's not a specific uh, dollar figure on a global level, as there are uh, costs that are uh, necessary to incur and that there's agreement that it's, uh, it's needed for protecting students, we'll incur those costs. So we were also told that um, parents who weren't necessarily comfortable sending their kids back to school, that's not a good enough reason to be able to, to distance learn. Can you just expand on that a little bit on who would be allowed to distance learn and why maybe it's, it's not okay if you're just not comfortable, why there has to be a specific health concern? So for us, the comfort level when it comes to uh, the school system and the protocols comes in working together with the school divisions and with public health. They, um, the school divisions have been working hard on plans. You're going to see those uh, next week. Um, all of them, all of those who are involved in the school system, they have one overriding goal, and that is they want to ensure that their students uh, are safe. And so the combination of their efforts together with public health advice and direction uh, provides that comfort uh, for us. And that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be cases of COVID uh, in schools. There are cases of COVID in society and our students live in society, but we need to be COVID ready. And the uh, work with public health and the school divisions, I think, uh, have given us that comfort that they will be COVID ready. As is always the case in the school system, uh, Brittany, where a student can't go to school because of a medical reason, uh, they are provided with the resources from the school division and their individual school, and that would be the case here as well. So if a student is self-isolating because they've been asked to self-isolate and they're awaiting a test uh, result, they would be given the resources, uh, or if they have to stay home because they're immune compromised and that's been uh, you know, medically directed, then they would be given those resources as well. In terms of, uh, you know, there are different times and different um, reasons why parents have taken options to do different things within the public uh, school system, or sorry, within the Public uh, Education Act, there are different options. And so parents can access the public school system, they can access the independent school system, they can access the homeschooling system. Um, I think uh, last year approximately 4,000 students uh, were homeschooled in, in the traditional way of homeschooling. I'm not talking about sort of the emergency education system that happened in, uh, in March. Uh, and so those have always been alternatives, but we are comfortable with the school system because of the work of the school divisions uh, together with public health. 
So is the recommendation, if you as a parent are not comfortable sending your child to school, um, that's not a good enough reason to, to be able to do distance learning, but maybe look at alternative options, such as homeschooling? There, there have always been alternative options that uh, were accessible for parents who, for whatever reason, didn't feel comfortable sending their uh, students to a public school system or who just simply chose uh, that uh, form of education because they believed that it would be better for their son or daughter. That has always been uh, an option that has existed in the Manitoba leg uh, legislation. It's always been considered a uh, viable and a valuable uh, option, and that exists uh, now in a pandemic, and it will exist after the pandemic. Minister, what gives you the confidence, given that we have seen positivity rates go from next to nothing to over 1.0%, moderate case numbers announced daily for the past week and a half. Confidence comes part from where it's always come from for me, and that is because we are listening to uh, our medical experts and their medical advice. There have been different parts at different times in this uh, pandemic where there have been significant concerns. And so I mentioned early on in my comments that when we uh, chose to suspend in class learning in March, there was that one week preparation period. We thought that that was valuable for parents and for teachers to prepare. And yet, if you go back and look, you'll see there was tremendous concern by many expressed about having that one week. And that was in some ways demonstrated uh, within our school system. And yet the public health advice was right and it was good at that time. And that week, um, from a public health perspective, I believe went well. We were also given advice from, uh, from our health officials prior to going back in June in a limited use uh, way. There were thousands of students who were welcomed back into school, so preparations were done already at that time in terms of flow and other things, uh, and that went well. Uh, we were told that we could continue to have schools open for summer school and for day camps all through this summer. That's happening uh, right now where there are thousands of students who've accessed those schools for summer school or for day camps and that's been informed by advice from public health. So as a parent, uh, I have concerns too. That is not uh, unusual. Uh, as I said, my son is going into high school uh, this year and of course I think about these uh, same things for him as well. So where do I draw my comfort? Quite apart from being the Minister of Education, I draw my comfort from, as a parent from the fact that public health has led us extremely well uh, up to this point in this pandemic. Uh, and there's no reason not to believe that, that their advice will not continue to be uh, as solid as it's proven to be in the past. I think part of the reason why parents are very have these concerns is because they keep hearing advice that don't enter indoor crowded spaces. However, your child is going to be going to school in a classroom where the classes haven't been capped, and that's something we've been hearing from the public health agency. We're hearing from sick kids these recommendations to reduce those class sizes. So, what is I guess, Dr. Rusin, do you want to comment on the class sizes? Well, uh, you know, certainly some of the class sizes will be uh, will be reduced uh, in in high school, and where we're not able to cohort, um, and um, you know. Uh, there's still the physical distancing that's uh, that's required, um, and uh, the two meters may not be able to be um, achieved in all circumstances. But uh, certainly, there's distancing there, that minimum of one meter. Uh, we've had a lot of safeguards, right? We take that layered approach. So the important thing is we can't have any symptomatic teachers or or students back in in school, and we're going to take that very seriously. Uh, hand hygiene, uh, all these efforts, and now even on top of all those things, uh, mask use. Uh, so we have a, a multi-layered approach right now uh, that um, you know offsets uh, any um, uh, you know any of those issues. And Maggie, to to your question and to Dr. Reeson's point, I think you're going to find when the individual plans come out next week. Then I mentioned this. Uh, in the earlier press conference, um, the two press conferences, that so one of the biggest challenges is going to be high schools because almost every class in a high school, in many high schools, are electives. And so there is significant um, movement between students and it's difficult to cohort. So when that cohorting can't be achieved, then there is a requirement for two meters, which I think the doctor has said in the past is really are probably our best 
protection. Uh, and so I think you're going to see a high percentage of those high schools who are going to be doing the two meters, which is going to mean that there's going to be um, uh, smaller class sizes in the group that the evidence might show where there's the highest uh, potential for transmission. But that does mean that even though those classes or those schools will be open and there will be full-time learning, uh, it might not always be every day in the school for those high school students. And we talked about that as a very real possibility uh, in the two previous press conferences. And I think you're going to see that in the individual plans, that there are going to be many high schools where students won't be there every day. They'll be learning every day because there are going to be the expectations of what they need to learn when they're not in the class. Um, but that there will be smaller class sizes as a result of that because they will be achieving the two meters distance because they won't be achieving the cohorting. What does that mean for parents, though, if you have high school students who are at minimum at school twice during each six-day rotation? Parents have jobs. Uh, if you've got a 15-year-old or a, a whatever staying home, they're expected to have some sort of supervision for some capacity. If you've got four days a week that a kid is home by themselves, what do you say to those parents? Uh, well, I am one of those parents, and so obviously you know, that is uh, a challenge. And and um, obviously at a certain age, uh, children are uh, able to, to be able to be home. But one of the things that we did say, and that I said uh, six weeks ago, and that regardless of the situation, whether it is a high school student or whether it's busing, uh, or whether it's the potential that uh, a younger student might um, you know, become sick with something that uh, isn't uh, able to be distinguished between uh, COVID or other sorts of things, the flu season, and they should stay home, um, that there have to be uh, plans made for that. And that doesn't, and that also involves into an earlier question, uh, working with your employer. Uh, the pandemic is inconvenient and it will continue to inconvenience us for a while. And those preparations, uh, I know as a parent, aren't always easy, um, but uh, they have to be made. But I think that it's probably easiest in the high school years where there is more ability for individual uh, students to uh, to be able to be without uh, a parent. It is easier in the high school years, clearly, than, than it would be if you're in the grade, you know, two, three, or four years. Do you have an average of how many? You said two, two days a week, a minimum per rotation for high school students. Do you have an average right now of what we might be seeing? So, so um, many high schools, uh, even though they want, some high schools will be able to go back uh, full time. Others won't have uh, achieved that, will, but will be more than the two days. Uh, but you'll you'll see the specific plans for the uh, for the schools next week, and that is going to be, you know, really critical, obviously, for for parents. I think that today's information, I hope, will give them comfort that we are following public health advice and that there are specific standards that are across the province. But every school is configured a little differently. Every school has a different population within it, uh, and so where they enter and how their recesses get staggered and how their classes get staggered because even though, um, as Dr. Rusin has said, there's a strong recommendation in terms of wearing masks in those congested areas, uh, that doesn't mean that there's not considerable effort happening now to make sure that those areas don't get congested. Uh, and that'll be staggering uh, recesses, staggering classes, Tremendous effort has gone into those plans to making sure that wherever possible there isn't that congestion. I mean, we've seen, obviously, and you'll have seen in different places uh, in the world. Um, and by the way, there are many places in the world where, where students have returned uh, back to school and they were back to school in the spring, and so there's been lessons learned from that uh, as well. But the uh, goal will always be to reduce that congestion. What has significantly changed other than obviously going to a strong uh, mask recommendation from your June moderate draft plan? So I think that there are, there are more details in terms of the protocols that exist within, uh, within the plan. Certainly one of the questions that we needed to do a better job of answering for uh, parents, and I think that this plan does, and it's, it's other than questions around masks or whether or not students would be going back at all, probably the question that I've gotten the most from parents is, what happens if there's a case? So do I get notified if, um, if my child is in that school but maybe didn't have the close contact? Uh, what's our response? Has the entire school closed down? Does everybody have to self-isolate? Those are the kind of questions that were coming up, and they're legitimate and real questions for, for parents to have. And so this provides more advice in terms of the information we provided to that 
uh, to the individuals within the school. Um, and there'll be more detailed advice provided, I think, in the, um, in the daily briefings as well. So it's not about closing down an entire school system, um, but ensuring that information gets out to those who need to have the information, but also provides them assurance. On that, sorry, on that note, what, what tools other than contact tracing do you have to determine if the virus is spreading within the facility? Is that kind of the only way to tell? Yeah, you know, the, um, uh, the way we set up to, to prevent that and in the cohorts uh, is to, uh, will help our ability to contact trace, but that's really how public health will, um, uh, will do this. We will um, identify cases early, uh, identify those close contacts. If we can't narrow it down, then it might be an entire cohort. Uh, but we're going to do whatever we can to um, uh, do what we normally do is narrow down those contacts as, as soon as possible. And so if uh, somebody within a cohort of up to 75 um, tests positive, then that whole co cohort could potentially have to self-isolate? Potentially, potentially. So we have a lot of these safeguards in that, uh, that would... Uh, uh, minimize uh, the need for the entire cohort to go, uh, but um, uh, but it certainly is possible that a, that a cohort could have to self-isolate. Do we have the bus capacity for all parents who need bus transportation to get it? I know earlier you said you were going to rely on parents that could to drive their kids. For some, that's simply just not possible. So we encourage parents that wherever possible they should consider um, they should consider driving their son or daughter to school, but obviously where they can't, we need to provide that service. And so I think that the ability to consider the bus itself as a cohort, uh, so students who are on that bus are essentially themselves a cohort, uh, is helpful. The ability, of course, to sit with a family member um, has been helpful, and the ability to sit on the bus, and these are all under the bus uh, guidelines which are linked within the document that is, that's online, the ability to sit with others who are in your school cohort uh, is also been helpful. So why school divisions initially indicated that that might be one of their greatest barriers, and I wouldn't want to say that it's still not a challenge, uh, we are hearing less concerns from the school divisions on the transportation than we were in in June when uh, they weren't necessarily being considered a cohort on, on the bus, but you'll get more of those details, of course, with the individual divisions, and for some divisions it'll be more of a challenge uh, than for others. Moving over to Dr. Rusin here, sorry. Dr. Rusin, I'll still give you in a few minutes, so any more questions? For Dr. Rusin, I'm switching back to Brandon here right now. Maple Leaf is still my colleague in phrase, actually, it's 31 of its employees now that are, uh, have contracted COVID-19. Um, we have seen Maple Leaf offer to buy masks for everyone in Brandon. Yesterday, the Premier said that he didn't believe public the, the medical advice warranted a symptom active testing, but federal c c regulations, as the opposition pointed out, actually do recommend asymptomatic testing uh, when there's an outbreak at a, at a meatpacking plant. So I, I have to ask you again why there is not a, a symptomatic testing at the business that you don't identify, which is Maple Leaf. Right. So the... Um if there is a transmission within a facility, an outbreak within there, then we, like we do now, is we test contacts, asymptomatic contacts. So we're doing that right now. Uh, so anyone who's an asymptomatic contact uh, is offered testing. There just aren't any, um, uh, isn't any transmission within the facility that we uh, can identify right now. Uh, so uh, throughout all of the uh, Manitoba right now, asymptomatic contacts are tested. Um, so does that yeah. include everybody that might be living together who works sure. together at the plant? Yeah, anyone who's identified as a close contact is offered asymptomatic testing. And we're on Brandon, forgive me, Brittany. Um, the 67 cluster cases, are there more than 67 cases in Brandon in total? Yes. Um, uh, I don't have the exact number because it's the, um, uh, we can continue to take numbers off uh, there, but it's, it, the, it's the vast majority of cases in Brandon are linked to that cluster. There are a few that are uh, what we'd call that non-epi-linked. How many are not? How many are not epi-linked or community transmission, whatever term you prefer? In in Brandon, I don't have the specific one. So in our last uh, seven days, uh, our non-epi-linked cases are are listed at 25 uh, in for the province. Uh, but as I mentioned, that's often a, an overestimate because cases that just haven't been investigated yet are lumped there. The 25 are active cases, not our total cases. So that's the last seven days. Yes. So you had three that were at the the business made believe that you said that weren't necessarily Necessarily connected to the cluster are those are those considered community transmission then no they're they're linked to um, other other cases in the community just not happen to be in the um, that cluster 
Dr. Usna, I can't help but note the ventilation guidelines are more robust than before. Um, can you speak to why this is more of an importance for, for public health? So we know that uh, that ventilation, uh, when there's good ventilation, it decreases the um, the likelihood of transmission of virus. That's why we uh, talk about outdoor uh, activities, right? There's essentially infinite uh, um, ventilation, uh, and so uh, we st uh, wanted that to be part of a of a safer return to school. So we talk about things like uh, avoiding the recirculation of the air, um, uh, minimizing use of fans, uh, increasing um, fresh air intake, whether that's through an HVAC system or through opening windows. So a uh, number of recommendations just so that uh, uh, schools are informed on how they can uh, um, uh, have adequate ventilation. Can you also tell us that grade 5 number? Some other jurisdictions are using grade 4. Why did Manitoba go with grade 5? The, um, uh, most of the guidelines are age 10. Uh, and so we didn't want to do it by by an age group where you might have half of a class wearing a mask and not. So we just uh, um, we, we felt that that age 10 was best reflected by, by grade 5. Okay, maybe Minister Gerson could be uh now. He has to go. I sorry. I thought you said it was Mr. Roos. Dr. Roos. I'm oh, sorry, Dr. Roos. He's trying to help me on Bart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Roos, can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've heard from yourself and from Freeman Pallister the fundamentals of what's going to get us through this. I'm going to mean being socially distant at school is going to be tough. Avoiding a large indoor gathering is, is virtually what a school is. Um, regular hand washing will become tough when you can't send all students to the bathroom at the same time. Uh, and there's high touch surface areas. So I mean, is a school sort of like, does it stand in the face of sticking to fundamentals if, if fundamentals are so important? No, uh, a few of those things that you mentioned are being addressed, so hand washing, uh, right? So there's uh, there's ways of, uh, of uh, organizing that without having to send all kids to the washroom at the same time. Um, sanitization, that we have protocols for that, so there's uh, there's efforts in that. The distancing um, uh, is achieved um, uh, uh, for the most part, you know, in in, uh, in hallways, there's protocols in place, so there's not crowding. We mentioned in high school, um, in the lower grades where transmission um, is is um, not as uh, likely, uh, then the full two meters may not be be able to be uh, um, uh, obtained. Uh, but there are all those protocols. That's why I take that that layered approach. So I think the fundamentals are still there. Um, and um, uh, and we're going to you know really watch that situation closely. One last one for you, Dr. Rusin. The school, the, the the plan here, you're asking schools to control traffic and do what do what they can. And what do you say to teachers? You say you know it's like keeping kids in one place and getting them to follow directions is worse than hurting cats. What do you, what do you say to teachers? Well, I think the. Um you know, it goes back to the you know engagement, uh, and so we've engaged with uh, with the divisions, with uh, education. So we provide public health advice. The plans, the specific plans, are being done by the people who know this best. Um, so, um, so I would uh, you know uh, defer to some of their expertise on how they're going to manage these uh, these situations. I don't know. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Kent. Maybe just a couple more for the minister. And then we can yeah, Minister Wilkinson, you said that you guys will be purchasing some PPE. There will be masks available for students who maybe can't afford to get them themselves or whose parents don't have that accessible. Have you guys already put in any orders so far for shields or PPE at this time? So uh, the procurement will happen through central services. Uh, and so I believe in terms of shields, uh, to the extent that they'll be used, that they have a significant uh, supply within central services. Uh, the procurement of those daily use masks, or the procurement of the cloth masks, I believe will be uh, undertaken at this point. And of, and of course, as you mentioned, Brittany, I mean, there are, we're now in a time when there are lots of families who already have this and, and they'll have a reusable mask that they are, their children might be wearing. I mean, uh, you know, I was in Costco uh, last week and, you know, saw lots of, uh, lots of people wearing uh, masks, young people wearing masks, and so that's not uh, an unusual uh, thing at this stage of the game, but there'll be some who, who don't. So is the, the idea the province is going to, ha or school divisions will have through the province stockpiles of masks in their schools in case students need them and show up without them? Yeah, so they'll have to be available obviously uh, at the school because uh, even if uh, students have masks uh, of their own, uh, students are students, they're still people they forget, right? And so they might forget to bring uh, their masks and so they'll have to be some within the schools and then some that'll be warehouse stocked out uh, elsewhere in government. Now there's been talk of ramped up mental health support, so can you speak specifically to what 
we can expect in schools when it comes to increased supports? So, so there are supports, of course, already that uh, exist when it comes to uh, some wraparound services. There's True North Youth Foundation that's been doing work. We announced uh, last week uh, continuing our relationship with Sheldon Kennedy's uh, Respect in School organization. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll continue to monitor to see what exactly the impact has been. Uh, it is it is difficult. We we know that that there'll be um, different mental health um, challenges. I think, um, or at least we believe that. I, maybe I shouldn't even say that that we know that. Our expectation would be that there would be right because of what kids uh, have gone through. But we're not sure uh, entirely if, if that will result in necessarily more. And so we're certainly monitoring that. We have organizations that are already involved in the schools that we could uh, scale up uh, and do more of what they're already doing if if need be. But we need to get a sense of what that looks like. And it's going to be difficult until we see uh, students come back. Uh, sometimes students and young people are more resilient than we think, um, but we're all going through this for the first time. And so we want to make sure that we have the resources in place we do, but they're agile enough that they can be scaled up if we need more or altered if we need something different. Do all schools have a nurse on, like, whether, you know, if a student starts showing symptoms, how can... How will that be dealt with? Yeah, I mean, certainly many uh, schools uh, have nurses. There, there are many schools, you know, that have many uh, different resources when it comes to things that are outside of your traditional education uh, system. Uh, I don't believe that every uh, school would have a nurse, but certainly the divisions themselves would have that ability. And so they have the protocols that are being placed, that self-screening um, is being asked of parents to do with uh, young people before they leave their homes and then they'll be screening when um, when young people uh, get to school that can be uh, happen as well with teachers so there'll be lots of screening but you know I think the the one thing about where we're at now that is different than where we were at in March uh, is that a lot of these things have become um, common for uh, for society and people so I know for myself when I walk into a store now one of the first things I do is I look down and I look for the arrows well I wouldn't have done that back back in March um, and I know for for young people and for students they've sort of got this idea of, of social distancing in their mind not that they're going to do it perfectly for sure uh, but they certainly have a better understanding of it than they did uh, in March and they understand that there's going to be directional sorts of things that was already happening to a large extent in June and they would have seen that in some schools and those who are in summer school or in other sort of day camps will have seen that in their schools already so uh, for some, I think that there's this feeling that, you know, the lights have been off for five months, and now we're going to turn the lights on on September 8th and see how this goes. There's been a lot of this that's been happening already with the partial reopening of schools, summer schools, day camps. Much of this has been happening now for, for months already. Okay, thanks a lot. Wait, wait, thanks. I do have one last one. Please, please. Um, Minister, I, I suspect that a lot of the school divisions are just going to take your strong recommendation and say, no, masks for everyone, and that's up to the divisions, I assume. What would you say to people, and I'm seeing a lot of commentary on, on the unscientific sample that is social media, uh, what would you say to someone who's concerned that the lack of the mandate might encourage the possibility for bullying between people who do or don't wear masks? So, first of all, when it comes to any kind of bullying, and I'm, I'm really glad you asked this question in part. Um, it, it goes a little bit to what Dr. Rusin talks about kindness, but when it comes specifically to math, first of all, don't take your scientific advice from social media. Uh, we take our scientific advice from uh, public health. So uh, I'm also on social media, and sometimes I regret that decision, but I see lots of things, and I hear lots of things, and I get lots of messages uh, from, from people who uh, you know believe to be experts uh, in the medical profession. Uh, but we listen to our... Uh, chief provincial health officer in public health because not only are they truly medical professionals, they're medical professionals in the Manitoba context. And so even if some things might be true in a different context or a different place in the world, that doesn't necessarily mean that they fit in the Manitoba context. When it comes to mass, though, you're right. Uh, because it's a recommendation, you're going to see different things. And I would say the same thing to students that I would say to anybody else in society. If you see somebody uh, wearing a mask, um, that is uh, something that you should treat respectfully. And if there, you see somebody who is not, we don't know their individual circumstances in terms of why they may not be wearing a mask. And so I think that you should treat them respectfully. Uh, the best thing that we can do in a pandemic when there's lots of emotion, and I experience those emotions as well, 
uh, is to be kind, to be respectful, to try to put yourself into another place, uh, person's shoes, and when you can't, remember that they may be experiencing something that that you might not know on the surface or in the face of it. So I would say that to all the students as they're going back, not just on the issue of masks, but there are a lot of young people who will have gone through a lot of difficult things when the school uh, were, uh, were closed for in-class learning, and let's be respectful of each other. Uh, because that, I think, will be one of the best things we can do and that we'll remember when we're on the other side of the pandemic. Thanks for asking that question, Bart. Thanks, everybody. It was good to see you. Hope you have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thanks for answering that one.